I'm going to discuss uh, our strategy for commercialization of salt-cooled reactors. At MIT, along with Berkeley and Wisconsin, we have a salt-cooled reactor project that's looking at an advanced reactor, which I will show one view graph of. And we're doing experiments such as running salt at 700C inside the MIT reactor. The central issue for any advanced reactor is the economics, because if the economics doesn't work, nobody's going to buy it. And so that is the subject of today's discussion. So I'm going to start with the conclusions, and then I'll uh, work uh, backwards to, the, to how we got there. Uh, the first one is the characteristics of the electric grid are changing, so different electrical generating systems are required. Second, there are large economic incentives to couple reactors to nuclear air Brayton combined cycle plants, similar to natural gas power plants. And third, it turns out for technical reasons, only salt pool reactors can couple to NAC, uh, which may be the next direction in nuclear power. Well, let's take a look at where these conclusions come from. Roadmap for advanced reactors, or at least our roadmap, we start with the market, seems like a good starting point, which defines requirements. And that leads down at the third level to the reactor and the program design. So let's start taking a look at the market. And the market, of course, for an advanced reactor at the earliest is 2030 because of development times. So let's think about 2030. The 2030 electrical market. Carbon likely to be taxed, traded, or constrained to fight climate change. Intermittent renewable capacity will steadily increase. That's solar and wind. We will need more flexible uh, peak generating capacity. And last, negative price electricities uh, need to be offset or avoided to maximize return on investment. Uh, what does that all mean? Well, let's first take a look at the variable electrical demand. This happens to be the yearly uh, cycle of electrical demand in New England. And of course, you will see uh, there's the seasonal peaks, summer air conditioning peak, winter peak. There are also about 50 some small peaks, which is the workday weekend variation, and of course all the scribble up and down, which is the night and day. Now, what's the practical implication of that curve? Well, the practical implication of that curve is that in a free market, the price of electricity varies. In particular, this shows the price of electricity in dollars per megawatt hour. That's zero, that's $50 a megawatt hour. This happens to be the Texas grid last year. I didn't have the Ohio grid. And if you look at the price of electricity, it varies according to the year. And uh, for about, uh, if you were paying $25 a megawatt hour in the electrical in Texas, you could buy electricity at that price for about 700 hours a year. At times of peak electric demand, uh, that same electricity would cost you $50, and at a few times, more than $100 a megawatt hour. At other times, you can buy that electricity for essentially zero. You have the middle of the night, low electrical demand. It's very difficult to bring the big nuclear and coal and other plants down to zero. So they go down as far as they can. They have excess electricity and they sell it to the grid. And in some cases, at some times, they actually pay the electrical grid to take the electricity in the middle of the night. We have, in the United States, negative priced electricity. Most people don't recognize it. The utility people understand this entirely. Now, what's the message here? Avoid low prices. Don't produce electricity at negative prices. Really bad idea. And the other thing is, we'd like to produce some electricity at times of maximum prices. We want to maximize revenue. Well, let's imagine what happens if we add renewables. I'm going to use some California data. Uh, the far left curve here is the electrical demand for a spring day. Now, the spring day is the worst case day. This is when you have low electricity demand. And it shows the variation in electric demand over one day in California and where that electricity came from. You have hydro and you have uh, combined cycle plants, imported electricity, nuclear electricity, and a variety of other things. Let's add a little photovoltaics. And what I'm defining here is the fraction of total electricity produced in a year from photovoltaics divided by the total electric demand of California. Recognizing photovoltaic output is maximum in the summer, on actually the June 22nd or 21st, and it's minimized in the middle of winter. So photovoltaics varies all over the, all over the seasons. 
Let's add 2% of total electricity in California. And that's the yellow uh, photovoltaics. Now that's pretty nice, you know, it comes in at time of peak demand. Let's add 6% photovoltaics on minimum spring days. Suddenly, the electric demand, the photovoltaics are meeting almost half the demand at the particular hour of the day, about, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Of course, that means that everything else on the grid is going through this incredibly wild transient as you almost shut down and start up. What happens when you get to 10% uh, photovoltaics? So 10% photovoltaics on a spring day, which is where the problem first shows up, essentially for a very short period of time, you know, 10 minutes, essentially all the electric demand in California is met by photovoltaics. It's a really wild grid. It has another implication. If you're a photovoltaic owner and you're on a free market, at what price will you sell electricity? You'll sell electricity at any price above zero. So in the middle of the day here, the price of electricity goes down to essentially zero, which of course actually means the photovoltaics guys have zero revenue, but that's a separate issue. I'm not going to cover that. The other thing that happens is, is when these guys aren't operating, like over here, the price of electricity is going to go up. If I run a power plant and you put in photovoltaics and my power plant's only going to run half the time, I'm not going to build a new replacement plant unless the electricity I sell at this time, when the photovoltaics disappears, sells for twice as much money. You know, if I'm going to build a new plant and it's only going to run 4,000 hours versus 8,000 hours, you better double the price of electricity or I'm not going to invest. I hope you don't invest. Well, what does that mean? Here's our price curve, the price of electricity, number of hours per year. We add renewables, we're going to have a lot of depressed electricity prices in the middle of the day. And then we're going to have some other times of day where the price of electricity doubles and triples. Welcome to the electric market of 2030. And needless to say, if I'm building a power plant, I want to sell electricity at high prices. Well, those photovoltaic guys sell electricity at low prices. Seems like a good strategy, business strategy. I don't know why I'm concerned about revenue, but it seems to have something to do with profits. <laughs> now, for the really fun and humorous part of this discussion, uh, this is some numbers from the California ISO. ISO is, is the grid operator in California. And this is based on their actual projections of what they expect to happen. Now, it turns out in California, this is a spring day analysis. In California, they have these massive subsidies for solar, so they're going to put in this massive amount of photovoltaics in the next couple of years. And this is stuff that's in, been permitted and under construction. And this line here shows the typical spring day electrical demand curve. That's the top line. And then it shows what happens when you add photovoltaics. This is 2013. Uh, by 2015, this is how much photovoltaics they will add. And by 2020, this is how much photovoltaics they will have in a spring day. And so what you find if you look at this chart over here, as in a spring day in the morning, they have 21,000 megawatts. Uh, when all this photovoltaics comes in, the non-photovoltaic uh, power production will go down to 11,000 megawatts. Drops by a factor of two. And then there comes the <coughs> evening. Now it turns out, the sun, in terms of photovoltaics, begins to fall out of the sky about 4 p.m. So your photovoltaics demand is going down. At the same time, everybody's turning on the lights at home and the ovens for cooking. And your power demand goes up. And so the 2020 projection for California is that the non-photovoltaic power plants will need to roughly double their output in approximately two and a half hours every day around five o'clock. This is going to be an exciting grid. <laughs> now, uh, what they're currently doing is they're buying gas turbines like mad, high speed, high start, terribly inefficient gas turbines that will burn gas. General Electric is more than ecstatic about this. It's the best thing that's happened to General Electric in a decade. So a whole bunch of new gas plants are being built to operate a couple of hours a day. Really expensive way of doing business. And because they're fast start, 
They're only used a couple of hours a day. And they're very inefficient natural gas turbines. That's the world. Welcome to California. Now, uh, bottom line, gas turbines are the only technology that can actually meet this variable demand. That's, that's the reality of the situation. Well, let's suggest we need to start thinking about how does nuclear power fit into this? And the discussion I'd like to point out is salt-cooled reactors and air braking power cycles. And that by the proper coupling of reactor technologies with gas turbines, I can take over this market, hopefully at less cost than the conventional gas turbines. And we're going to talk about a system that has faster response than the traditional gas turbines and uh, perhaps better pricing. Now, salt-cold reactors, which I'll go into very uh, shortly, have the characteristic that they are the only high-temperature reactor capable of coupling to a gas turbine. That's why we're talking about salt-cold reactors and gas turbines. All the other reactors are low-temperature reactors that actually can't couple. Now, there are two classes of salt-cooled reactors. Uh, first is a fluoride salt-cooled reactor. That's the kind of reactor I'm working on and the Berkeley, Wisconsin, MIT team is working on. It's salt coolant, high temperature gas-cooled reactor fuel, same fuel as used in an HTGR, air braking power cycle, and passive safety systems from sodium-cooled reactors. So it's a solid fuel reactor, HTGR fuel with a few minor modifications, I won't go into the details, and a clean, clean salt coolant. The other uh, type of salt-cooled reactor is the what they call a, a molten salt reactor or thorium salt-cooled reactor, lots of other terms. And that's where you dissolve the fuel in the coolant. So I'm the solid fuel guy, the fellows over there, are the, they dissolve the fuel in the coolant. Lithium beryllium fluoride. In both cases, lithium beryllium fluoride. Uh, and we would propose you get to an air break cycle. Now, why? Let's go into the properties of uh, FHR and molten salt reactors and why they use fluoride salt coolants. So low pressure, high temperature coolant, that's very nice. The baseline salt for neutronics reasons that have to do with reactor physics is fly. Uh, melting point of 460 Celsius, boiling point over four, over 1400 Celsius. Now, what's noted, the problem, uh, the good news and the bad news about fluoride salts is they have high melting points. That means I'm a high temperature reactor with high temperature heat. I have no choice. It's whether I like it or I don't like it, I'm a high temperature reactor. And it turns out that characteristic, because I'm forced to operate at high temperature, is also the reason I can hook to an air braking cycle. Not because I like to, it's because I have no alternative. Now, in all of these machines, we're talking about delivering heat to the power cycle between 600 and 700 Celsius. 600 C, so we're above the melting point, 700 C because of material limits. Ultimately, that might go to 800 C. And we have a base case salt, this flied salt, that gives us properties. There are several other candidate salts. We're not limited to one salt. But they're all high temperature salts. They all have high melting points. They all have somewhat similar properties. You use the fluoride salts because they have low neutronic uh, parasitic absorption of neutrons. In my case, we also use the fluoride salts because they're fully compatible with HTGR graphite fuel. So there's a chemical compatibility issue as well as a neutronic issue. Now, how are we different? This uh, FHR and a molten salt reactor are in a different reactor space. When we talk about low temperature reactors at high pressures, well, that's a light water reactor. Low temperature is 300 C. Medium, sodium cooled fast reactor, that's a low pressure reactor at 500 C. High temperatures, that's us, FHR, molten salt reactor, and the high temperature gas cooled reactors. Uh, we're low pressure, they're high pressure. Uh, the thing, uh, other the characteristic of a gas cooled reactor is they have low inlet temperatures, typically about 250 Celsius. That's driven by the need to keep the pressure vessel cold. So we're the high temperature guys. Now let's take a look at a nuclear air braking cycle. Uh, this is a modified version of a traditional natural gas combined cycle plant. And so we start with filtered air. And we run through a compressor. Now a standard General Electric combined cycle plant, when it goes through that compressor, is somewhere between 450 and 500 C exit temperature because of compression. This is the off-the-shelf GE model. Go send them a dollar, a few dollars, a few million dollars. 
And they'll send you their standard natural gas plant, and that compressor. Fairly high pressure ratio. Yeah, fairly high pressure ratio. Oh, 10, 15. It, this is hot, the, the state of the art. Uh, and that means if you're going to add heat to this compressed air, you have to be over 500 Celsius. It won't work. So we have our standard run mill GE compressor. We heat it up with our salt from our salt cooled reactor. Goes through a turbine producing some electricity. Goes through a second turbine, generates some more electricity. And like all air braking cycles, you get some pretty hot air going out. It goes to a steam boiler where you generate additional steam before it goes up to the atmosphere. And the steam can go to a turbine for electricity generation or sales. And that's the baseload plant. But we have some other options. After we do the nuclear heat, we're still at a pretty low temperature compared to run-of-the-mill natural gas plants, so we can do natural gas co-firing, or in the long term, biofuels or hydrogen. And if we do co-firing, what we do is we can essentially produce peak power and double the power output of this plant. So baseload nuclear, steady state, dull. We want peak power, pour in the gas or the hydrogen or the biofuels. Uh, the other little feature of this is it's really got fast response. And why does it have fast response? We have a baseload power plant hooked to the grid, running nicely along. You want a little gas, a little more power, you put in the peak power, but it's already running. It's not a cold start machine. And so it turns out about 50 milliseconds after you add natural gas, your power level starts climbing. That's faster than any normal natural gas plant can do by about a factor of 100. So this is not your grandmother's natural gas plant. <laughs> the second thing is, of course, we're producing steam. So if you happen to have a steam customer, you can go sell steam. Very different kind of plant, baseload with peak <coughs> capability. Peak features, capability to provide peak power with auxiliary fuel. Increased revenue after you pay for the natural gas, and I'll go into that shortly. Today, natural gas, long-term biofuels are hydrogen. Really fast response because we're hot, we're spinning, we're always on the grid. Remember, this is a baseload nuclear power plant that has some unique capability. Efficient natural gas to electricity con conversion and efficient process heat uh, conversion. Now, if we look at our plant, we have three operating modes. And we choose the operating mode to maximize revenue. Our first option, sell baseload electricity, break and power cycle, produces electricity to the grid, the steam plant produces electricity to the grid. Second option, we can make peak power. And peak power revenue in this case is revenue minus the cost of the natural gas. So it's money I get, not the gas company. And uh, we add natural gas to boost the heat input, can profit double the output, and we increase the power out coming out of this machine. Third case, electricity and steam sales. Uh, well, the baseload braking cycle only produces electricity, so we're going to sell that electricity to the grid. We're stuck on that. Uh, but we have this steam production capability, which is actually about half the energy coming out of the system. If we have some local industry, we will sell this steam uh, when we have low electric prices to that industry, and we will say, Dear industry, you have these gas boilers here that produces steam for industrial applications. At appropriate times, we're willing to sell you steam at about 90% of the cost of your natural gas to burn in your boilers to make steam for your process. So although this industrial guy has his own boiler, we'll offer him discount steam rather than sell negative electricity. Because I don't like paying the grid to get rid of my product. This is bad business. Well, we analyzed this for our particular system, for the Texas grid and for the California grid. Remember, every grid's different, so you get a slightly different economic analysis. And we have allowable operating modes, and the allowable operating mode is a baseload nuclear plant and the revenue, and we define that revenue as 100%. If we have baseload and we have the ability to produce peak power, our revenue in the Texas grid is now 125% over baseload. This is after we paid the natural gas bill. And this is all using 2012 data, by the way. Electrical grid, gas prices, so forth. 
California is slightly different. We can get them, they have a higher price peak power price. We get 144% of base load operation. If we have uh, no peak power, but we can sell steam to somebody when the price is low, in Texas, because of the large process industry, uh, we can, uh, our revenue will be 146% of a base load plant. In California, it'll be 134% of a base load plant. And that's just the difference of the economics and the grid in the two states. If we happen to have a situation where we can do base load peak and steam sales, peak when the price is high, steam sales when the price is low, our uh, analysis of the economics is that we will, uh, our revenue stream after natural gas will be 161% of a base load nuclear power plant or 167% in California. Nice revenue gain. Uh, more revenue than a base load nuclear plant. Uh, a lot of questions about salt cooled reactor economics. Can't answer those today, but anybody in two weeks can do these calculations and, 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 and uh, confirm our revenue case. You know, when you, when you talk about the cost of a nuclear plant, it's a debating game. You get 30 advocates and they all claim to be 20% cheaper than a light water reactor. It's a liar's club. And until you build some, you really don't know. On the other hand, two weeks, you can redo the, all these calculations and calculate out the revenue and you can do the analysis. And, the second, and of course, when this happens to be the California case, we boost the revenue by 67% over base load. Now, I also mentioned we had fast response capability. Really take off. No cold start. We're running base load. We're running in a peak above that. Now, I did, what I didn't mention earlier is that we're running hot enough is that we're above the auto ignition temperature of natural gas, hydrogen, or boil, boiler fuels. What does that mean? That means if we throw any hydrocarbon into this turbine, it's automatically going to burn. We do not have to control the oxygen air fuel ratio. Those guys who have normal natural gas plants have to worry about the right fuel ratio. We don't. We can throw a part per million natural gas in, burns immediately, because we're above this auto ignition temperature. We can run it stoichiometric, still burns. And that has a number of implications. We have infinite variability in power output. We have extremely fast response because we don't have to worry about mixing air and fuel, all those problems that cause jet engines to blow up. And it opens up a lot of capabilities, grid regulation, spinning reserve. Why do we want to do this? Well, it turns out that that fast response, response capability can stabilize the electric grid. And it turns out our friends at the utility industry are willing to pay for this service. They don't pay per kilowatt hour, they pay per kilowatt of capacity you can put online. Uh, for regulation, they typically are willing to pay about $700 a kilowatt hour of capacity. For reserve power and grid stability, they're willing to pay $300 to $1,000 per kilowatt of capacity, depending upon which electrical grid you're in. California, it's $1,000. Pacific Northwest, because of they have high, fast start uh, hydro plants, it's about $300. But California is $1,000 because they're using gas turbines. Another little nice source of revenue. I, you know, I, maybe the plant costs $5,000. Well, I can get a $1,000 credit coupon for auxiliary services. Example FHR design. It's a solid fuel reactor. This is part of our integrated project at MIT, uh, Berkeley, and Wisconsin. I'm not going to go into the details of the design. That little thing down in the corner is the reactor. <laughs> Those two things there are the heat exchangers. And this is your standard run-of-the-mill GE F7A.06 gas turbine. Just send them a check and they'll send you one of those. Well, you have to actually get the permits for the site. They'll send you the rest of the parts on a rail car with instructions of how to assemble. I'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, so the plant profile actually tends to be dominated by the, the gas turbine facility. Well, some conclusions. Changing conditions. The first and most important one is the air braking cycle, combined air braking cycle. The viability of this option simply would not have been viable 15 years ago. The efficiency of combined cycle natural gas plants was so miserable, you could not credibly hook it to a nuclear reactor. And so this is not an option that existed in the past. 
It's only because of the incredible advances in gas turbine technology in the last 15 years, both for aircraft and by derivative for natural gas plants, that this has become an option. It's very important to understand this could not have been done 15, 20 years ago. In particular, it's the tremendous improvement in the compressor efficiencies. Now, it turns out the compressor we're using is a standard GE compressor, and the reason is quite obvious. For a couple of billion dollars, you can develop one of these compressors. I mean, literally a couple of billion R&D dollars. And so our bottom line is, if you want to use it for a nuclear application, you're allowed to change the paint color, but nothing else changes. Because development of that technology is as expensive as developing a reactor. So this is a case where the power technology tells the reactor technology, this is what you have to do, which is the reverse of what we've historically done. Historically, we develop a reactor, and then we get a power technology to hook onto it. Very important to understand the distinction. And that adds some complications. There are some serious R&D challenges, which I'm not going to go into today because of limited time, but it's very important to understand that the power technology is driving the design decisions in the reactor. Uh, the second is we got new demands by a low carbon grid. It's just a reality. And that's changing. What that implies is if we can make all of this work, is increased revenue for reactors coupled to a nuclear air combined cycle plant. Lots of technical challenges. I will not understate that. On the other hand, I would not understate the 50% increase in revenue and the fact that it couples to where we expect the grid to go. It's an economic incentive to involve, to develop salt-cooled reactors, whether it's the solid salt-cooled reactor that we're working on or the more classical molten salt reactor. That's, that's a reactor design detail in the context of these power systems. <clears throat> and last, it's sort of back to the future because the original salt-cooled reactor uh, was designed for the Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Program, a jet engine, an air braking cycle, uh, being developed by GE and Pratt Whitney back in the 50s. And so we're sort of going back to the future, but back to the future because of the extraordinary advances in combined cycle technologies, and in particular the front end compressors of these really, really impressive natural gas combined cycle plants. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, do you have any questions?